A little bit about Poems for Peace. It was a Sika initiative, Latifa Taormina, who um, is responsible uh, for the founding of the Subud International Cultural Association, wanted to do something with the UN Day for Peace on September 21st, and did so in Austin, Texas, an event that continues um, despite uh, no Subud people being involved in it. And um, that has been the inspiration of this Zoom Muse series. Um, Zoom Muse was a project of Sika International, started by Emmanuel Williams and as something to do during the lockdown. And uh, it has evolved into this. This is our first Poems for Peace Zoom Muse presentation. So um, how exactly to create Poems for Peace and what is involved and what does that mean exactly are some of the things that we hope will be covered. Um, as we present uh, some of our favorite poets in the world, starting with Andrew Schelling, whom I've known for, I think, a quarter of a century, when he came to, with uh, Ann Waldman to the old splab in Auburn, Washington, the former slaughter, I think it was six days after the death of Allen Ginsberg, as a matter of fact. Andrew's a poet, a translator of Sanskrit, Pali, and other old India languages. He's an essayist. I especially like his post coyote poetics. And for the past 30 years, he's been a teacher at Naropa University in Boulder, Colorado, where he teaches poetry in the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics and Sanskrit for the Religious Studies Program. He's also an ecologist and naturalist, having traveled extensively in North America, Europe, India, and the Himalayas. His poetry collections include A Possible Bag from the Arapaho Songbook, Old Tail Road, Tea Shack Interior, New and Selected Poetry, The Road to Okosingo, Old Growth, Poems and Notebooks, 1986 to 1994. And he's the author of Wild Forms, Savage Grammar, Poetry, Ecology, Asia. Uh, so much I could say about Andrew Schelling, but I consider him an exemplary poet, a pure poet, uh, a teacher, a friend, a brother, a fellow seeker, and I look forward to seeing what he does today. Please welcome Andrew Schelling. Uh, thanks, everybody, for showing up today. Um, when Paul asked me to do a reading under, you know, the sort of general banner of poems for peace, you know, poets often dig into words. And, uh, you know, I decided to spend a couple of days meditating on these two words, poem or poetry, and peace. And, uh, you know, of course, I've spent a lot of time thinking about what poetry might be, and as a very amateur anthropologist, I see that the evidence suggests that everywhere, um, something like poetry has occurred among human beings ever since speech evolved, probably. And I'd probably take it a little bit further with my naturalist uh, you know, inclinations to see poetry as really like an organic natural function of the cosmos um, and that our human view of poetry is simply a recognition that certain primal forces or events can occur within us. So that maybe uh, what uh, the Chinese have called the Tao shows up in language as poetry. Um, that brought me to a question though, is poetry effective in bringing about peace. And then I wanted to sort of question, what does peace mean, actually? And I realized that, um, you know, it's one of those incredibly nebulous words we use for a wide range of possibilities, a little bit like we use the word love. Um, you know, is peace the absence of conflict? Um, you know, when you talk about, you say to somebody, may you be at peace, or a person is at peace with God, or at peace with themselves. Does anybody ever get at peace with themselves? I don't know, but um, you know that suggests some kind of perhaps absence of conflict. Um, then I began to think a little bit about the um, uh, you know the recent announcement, October eighth, of two 
recipients of the Nobel Peace Prize who are both journalists who have been recognized and acknowledged for walking into the teeth of conflict, really. Um, Maria Ressa from the Philippines and Dmitry Muratov from Russia, both of whom have um, you know, been unflinching and walking into very dangerous situations in their own nations. Um, the committee, the Nobel Committee, cited Maria Ressa for her work to expose abuse of power, use of violence, and growing authoritarianism. And uh, the Duterte government was a little bit hesitant to come out and acknowledge her. They finally did, but they wanted to remind everybody that she's considered in the Philippines a felon and accused of cyber libel. So here's some people who get recognized for peace, but you know their lives seem to be anything but peaceful. Um, you know, I began to wonder then uh, if peace is not so much an absence of conflict, but a way of confronting certain kinds of conflict. Um, many of you know the um, sort of remarkable, iconic British poet uh, William Blake. I used as a epigram for one of my books, a statement of his or a sentence of his. He says, for we have hirelings in the camp, the court and the university who would, if they could forever depress mental and prolong corporeal war. Depress mental and prolong corporeal war. So maybe for William Blake, Peace is something like the ability to carry out intellectual struggles, creative struggles, um, mental warfare, as he calls it. And he's also got a great insight in there, which is, um, you know, war is not something that just happens. It's something that comes from the hirelings. Um, you know, I think the middlemen, and that would be a much more modern way of understanding warfare, that it's often very cooked up by people with agendas. Um, and these are the hirelings in the camp, the court, and the university, sobering for those of us who are in the universities. Um, I've been reading Percy Bysshe Shelley lately and really appreciating his um, uh, somewhat renowned adage that poets are the unknown legislators of the world. This comes from his defense of poetry. He had a very similar sentence in an early, earlier piece of writing. Um, what could that mean? Poets are the unknown legislators of the world. Um, I've wrestled with that and don't have a good answer. I always liked uh, the American poet George Oppen's slight, uh, you know, sort of modification of that. Poets are the legislators of the unknown world. And that maybe is what ultimately we turn to poetry for, is to acknowledge things that most people aren't paying attention to. Um, you know, if there's any role in that for peace, it's because, you want to seize a hold of certain symbols or images and uh, hope that those who read your work or any poetry will recognize that maybe life is richer if you understand and live among those symbols. Um, we've got all sorts of wars around or absences of peace. You know, one of the big ones for all of us this last year and a half has been uh, the uh, pandemic that has broken out and the conflicts that's brought about. Um, so I thought I'd read the first poem, which I wrote from isolation when the pandemic came. Um, this is called Listening to an Autumn Raga in Springtime. And some of you may have, you know, clicked the link and seen it as the, uh, you know, little preview or trailer for my reading. And I'll, I'll read it again here. Um, this I dedicated to Ali Akbar Khan, one of the um, great disseminators of raga or classical Indian music around the world and particularly to the West. He founded a uh, School of Classical Indian Music, the Ali Akbar College in Marin County. He died in 2009. Um, 
But I want to go back to the title for a moment. We are in autumn now, of course, sort of mid-autumn, mid-autumn moonlight coming down upon all of us. It's called Listening to an Autumn Raga in Springtime. And the little little conflict in there is, those of you who know something about raga know that you should play or sing raga or even listen to it at the appropriate time of day or the appropriate season of year. And that it is a real violation of the forces of the cosmos, perhaps, to, um, you know, put on a raga to listen to in the wrong season. But sometimes you just have to do it because the pandemic seemed to turn upside down so many of what, you know, our expectations were. Um, and, uh, you know, sort of ironic that in springtime when everybody's hungry to get outdoors and bear your flesh to the sun, we were suddenly confined indoors as though a ferocious winter had come on. Listening to an autumn raga in springtime. What in the end did humans think we'd accomplish? Look at the bookshelf, Bhagavad Gita next to rakish Mark Twain, the Harlem Renaissance reader, tips against Antoine de saint Exupéry, who told writers, remove what's not needed. There's Boku, Gertrude Stein, Shakespeare, Lotz, and Ezra Pound squints in the grass at an ant. Confucius honed his thought and led him astray. The thick foxed Oxford anthology, hard to call that dry, leathery verse, poetry. Here's Field Guides, A Natural History of the Coyote Clan, Navajo Myth, Masks, Eco Warriors, and Say Shonagan, who made the best lists. But none of it saved us. A book on Mongol Buddhist horsemen, what did their art do? Windy, glacier-torn, cloud grass visions, bronze-breasted girls, Even Dante couldn't see those heavenly forms for the glare. Some master craftsmen painted lapis lazuli onto their curls. I won't open the book though. That three-eyed end of world death skull cuts closer than words. Virus, terror, blood, lies, war, dead cities every direction. So to the 300 cubic inch Sanskrit dictionary, 1879, blue frayed Oxford cloth ripped at the spine, MacBook Pro perched on its 3000 year lexicon tougher than Marx, Heidegger, Chomsky, head trips of the West. What in the end did humans think writing could do. Blanched musical fingers begin to play faded words, black holes, dying dwarf star doom, an autumn raga played by a dead man, posk flower in bloom. Say a word about that posk flower. That's the first flower that comes out in the spring where I live. It's sometimes called prairie crocus. Crocus because it appears first. I also love its name, prairie smoke, because it's got a sort of tough, smoky looking, purplish gray flower with lots of wispy little um, sort of hairs on it. Um, So that's a real springtime image there. listening to an autumn raga. I hope everybody's enjoying our, um, you know, autumn here. It is, uh, we're just a day past the full hunter's moon known in Europe as the blood moon sometimes. Some people call it the moon of withering grass. There are many, many names for the different moons. Um, This one ascended in Taurus yesterday, um, 
and put me in the mind of autumn a little bit. I had to build a fire this morning. Uh, the last of the aspen leaves are rattling outside. It's definitely heading into, uh, you know, that time of the year, which most people seem to agree in the, anywhere you are in the Northern hemisphere, autumn's the loveliest season, uh, both visually and in terms of the climate, the dryness. And we get, because of that dryness, these great spooky moons that come up around Halloween. So happy Halloween to everybody also. Um, here's a poem called After the Cricket. Back east, oh, I should say, I live in the Rocky Mountain bioregion, Southern Rocky Mountain bioregion. So for where I live, the eastern seaboard is back east. Some of you may be there on the eastern seaboard, so back east won't quite have the same meaning for you, but this is called After the Cricket. Back east, the New England landscapes feel archaic, compressed. A friend's recent letter speaks of Mount Greylock. Was it Herman Melville gave it the name? Mound of blue conifer looks in my memory smoky. I spent a week camped at its base, a little waterproof tent. My wife, Christina Oliver, who I worked with for years, our mid-sized shepherd dog, Muddy Prince on the swamp colored army surplus sleeping bags. We sorted books on a soft meadow all day. Someone, someone near Pittsfield had filled a barn with crazy old titles, lots on the architecture of early cathedrals, now wanted to sell them. 200 cartons we packed and shipped west to the collectivist bookshop we worked at. Finally, in my 67th year, I'm figuring out that jagged, jumbled up, cracked granite snarl of the Indian peaks, carved into pitching shapes during the last ice age. The drainages are called blue, green, rainbow, Jasper, and there's blocky old devil's thumb. Elk going over the passes longer than all human history. Hoof tracks mark the scary snow cornices. Chasms, chessmen, pinnacles, chutes, lurching spires we call hoodoos, relict glaciers and ice-fed lakes that clench your balls up into your belly. It's Tao Te Ching and Farmer's Almanac crunched by three billion years into one granite treatise, a text no one could figure out in one lifetime. And the foothills crickets arrived overnight. Julia Seiko once told me the elderly gardeners of Longmont who work the unforgiving soil beneath Long's Peak, say snow comes six weeks after the cricket. That's from a book, um, my last book of poetry, The Facts at Dog Tank Spring. Um, I'm going to, um, let's see, maybe read. Oh, Couple more poems from this. I want to read a poem called Where They Went. Since um, you know, we still live in this period of incredible uncertainty around COVID, the pandemic era or the COVID era, as I keep calling it, and friends of mine laugh at me for saying that. I was really um sort of uh uh felt justified when I saw the phrase the uh COVID era used in the New York Times, but this is a little glimpse back to what things were like in those initial moments of real concern for everybody we know and love, all our people, ourselves, our families, our friends. Um, I teach at Naropa University, so this is something that just sort of showed up in my notebook in those initial days of lockdown. So it's dated 2 April, 2020. And the title is Where They Went. Raquel's flight to Venezuela was canceled. 
Today, Alicia leaves for Oakland if the planes fly. Morgan drove to her parents in Lincoln, Nebraska. Kiara is quarantined in Aurora with family members who are high risk. With his chosen family of 11, Kyle high risk is isolated in Colorado Springs. Cryptic is Mona Lisa. Allison says her sister made it out of New York. Andy with green hair, upbeat, helpful, his eye a sparkle of pleasure. Dark in the screen, Eressa keeps working at the grocery. Shreya says the family situation in Kathmandu is worrisome. Essential worker at the BMW shop, Sarah couldn't join us. Heading for Maryland, Sam got placed in a patrol car. Last flight out, Myra made Bogota, now locked down two weeks at her mother's. Kendra lost all three jobs. Erotica made it to Ashland. Andrew disinfects classrooms, then locks them. A roommate of Elena's friend died of it. Anna lost her grandmother to the virus in New York. I think that poem's a little bit of a downer, but it is, you know, interesting to uh, remember what what the days were like in that initial, you know, um, uncertainty, and for many of us, panic, and people desperately trying to get home wherever home felt like to, um, you know, go into lockdown. Um, I'll read one more from this book, the title poem, The Facts of Dog Tank Spring. Um, one of the, um, you know, um, victories that gives me some optimism that recently came about was when uh, the Biden administration reinstituted the full extent of Bears Ears as a national monument. When Bears Ears had been removed from monument status by President Donald Trump, um, I felt very passionate about the land there. And I also felt that in order to be an effective thinker and speaker about protection of that land in southeastern Utah, I should spend some time visiting there and uh, did spend, you know, I've camped there quite a bit. Typically, I go to a hard to find little um, area called Dog Tank Spring. And this is a poem that came out of um, various trips down to Dog Tank, the facts at Dog Tank Spring. Three broke down gnarled cottonwoods at Dog Tank Spring. They're older than anything at Dog Tank Spring, the cloudy iced water, the high desert, two or three inches fresh rabbit track snow. Blaze orange and cobalt tents at Dog Tank Spring. The crackling juniper fire at Dog Tank Spring. The night stars wheeling close and mythically overhead. You could reach up and touch the sharp edges of constellations at Dog Tank Spring. Half human petroglyphs haunt the dream at Dog Tank Spring. But who talks about Aeschylus at Dog Tank? Orange sparks sift into the night. A coyote cries off in the sage at Dog Tank. Wonder where the dead go at Dog Tank Spring. Dog Tank Spring turkey buzzards go where? Dog Tank hiking comrades shout over wine at the night sky. At Dog Tank Spring, your cell phone don't work. The news went stale a thousand years past. Night drops to 12 degrees. The water jug freezes at Dog Tank Spring. Plans, hopes, aspirations, irresistible ideas at Dog Tank Spring. But human designs at daybreak seem the ravings of idiots. Dawn is for coffee at Dog Tank Spring. At Dog Tank Spring, the bow saw the ax, the work gloves, the matches, the Cedar Mesa map at Dog Tank Spring, spires, hoodoos, pinnacles of polished red sandstone, cream colored stone shelves at Dog Tank Spring, 
the trail guide says anticline and up warp at dog tank spring. Greasewood, rattlesnake, blue wavering lacoliths, the tiny oil painting tech to opinion by someone last month at dog tank spring. A hundred years are wet at dog tank spring. Dog tank past and future lead nowhere. What are spill-offs? Chalkstones, scorpions, the dugway, the sidereal. What's a rowel at Dog Tank Spring? The faraway ranch house, the constellations, the rabbit brush, the anvil headed clouds over Navajo. Let's talk about the old ones at Dog Tank Spring Tobacco Canyon, Bullet Canyon, Cane Gulch, the Turkey Pen ruins. Want to meet here in late March? Embers whiten and fade their fleeting books or old loves, a wool blanket over the cold sleeping bag. These things are facts at Dog Tank Spring. That poem too is secretly a pandemic era poem because I can't quite be at Dog Tank and then was supposed to be going back right when COVID began to emerge in the United States and I had a plan with a friend to meet there. And every day um, as things began to shut down, we backed further and further away from our plans to meet a dog tank and in the end didn't. And that's why uh, the line in there that says, let's plan to meet in March at dog tank um, didn't come to pass, got there subsequently. Um, lovely place. I'm not going to tell you where it is. Um, one of the best writers on the bear's ears, in fact, recently published a book on bears he called the bear's ears, a guy named Dave Roberts, who uh, the late David Roberts, he died several months ago. In his book, he quotes a Bureau of Land Management official who says to a friend, tell Dave Roberts to shut the fuck up. Um, keeping, uh, you know, these especially, you know, massive numbers of um, Anasazi ruins, rock art, um, and various things unmolested by the curious, the grave robbers, the, um, you know, the witless uh, four-wheel drive people and all. So um, for that reason, um, I'll tell you bears ears, but I won't tell you where dog tank spring is. I'm sure with a GPS, you can figure it out. Um, and if you get defiant enough, you can go camp there. If I show up, I'll find another place to camp. Um, let's see, I think I'm gonna read a poem now um, for uh, since, well, I can't see her, but I see that present is Amy Evans McClure, wife of Michael McClure. I have a, um, poem written after um, Michael took the long journey. Uh, my favorite poems of Michael's were always his ghost tantras with the great, you know, grahs and grahurs and, uh, you know, a fantastic mix of beast language with a few fragments of recognizable vocabulary or an occasional line working through. And I, I always told Michael I thought it was one of the most important books of the 20th century for the way it had really restored to human beings our connection with the animal body and the voice, the pre-linguistic voice moving into language and back out of it. And uh, so Michael, much beloved poet, I know Paul Nelson was very close to him. Um, uh, you know, Michael was a regular visitor with um, Amy at Naropa University, summer writing programs, um, beloved to many of us, recommend his work. There's a poem for him. It's called Grahur. During the night, Two, three hundred elk storm down sugarloaf snow and wind, a roar of churning hoofs through the icy mud. Wish I could tell McClure. Last time we met, there was a neo paleo butcher on Broadway, huge meat sandwiches for a youth clientele. 
out the window used car dealerships, appliance shops still open, but the old time eating place is gone. You're a meat guy. What was it like? Angry cops on the wings when Billy the Kid ate out Jane Harlow on stage. McClure in black hat looks more hip than the young eaters. Inside his sandwich, the shuddering elk flanks. Young women pass their blue, curious eyes across him. That was the last time I saw Michael. Um, and, you know, really sort of a lovely image of him eating a big meat sandwich, um, you know, among young hipsters and Michael looking handsomer and more hip than anybody else in the place. Uh, I urge people to read his work. He's, you know, he's really quite, quite fantastic. Um, let's see, on the um, question of poems and peace or poems for peace, uh, I found, um, you know, that I've recently written a poem that maybe says something to this with, of course, not being able to come to any conclusions, but I'm not sure the job of poem is to come to a conclusion, so we will see. Uh, this comes from a walk I did across southern Scotland with the poet Jerry Luce. Jerry um, is one of a number of poets I consider to be Scottish minimalists. Uh, they often work with uh, building poems out of all sorts of other things, other things than words. They work in, um, you know, botanical gardens and they do installations and various things and words drift in and out a little bit. But um, this is called for a Scottish minimalist at the Antonine Wall. And just to peg it historically, um, when the Roman Empire marched uh, through the British Isles, or I should say went sort of from the south around the London area, going up north and conquering uh, the island that you know now is England, Scotland, Wales, Cornwall, um, uh, they built a series of walls as they moved north to seal um, off the land they held from what they considered to be the sort of dangerous barbarian north. So the, the famous one people know of is Hadrian's Wall, but further north is the Antonine Wall, which moves across um, southern Scotland and was the line of resistance that the Roman soldiers held from the uh, you know, the tribes up north. So this is called For a Scottish Minimalist at the Antonine Wall. This unmortared rock wall seals a Roman battalion off from the shaggy tribal people north. A fur and feather clad people, a leather and flint arrow people, Listen to the rough, throaty gibberish of their songs. Their war paint scares the boyish conscripts far from their homeland, far from Rome and the vineyards, from wine which gives you a moment of courage, the girls with mouth-sized breasts, thighs smelling of almond oil. Today, tiny poems get swapped, coins of friendship, at a place iron arrows bristled under the blue fog, moon, and stench of fear. It seems impossible that a poem can withstand lithium, cobalt, plutonium, or Facebook. New chemicals drip into the sea and soil. Is there a chance poems might slip a gap? gap a fence or burrow under the rock. It is told in my country how Coyote found out the secret of fences. Bob Wire let him through. A tuft of blue hair, you gotta look close on the razor bar. He barked and it let him through. I like to believe Coyote, like these funny mangled poems of ours, outlast petrochemicals and concrete rises above the cold compounds of nature that decay and disappear. 
but no way we live standing on these old stone ramparts. No way we live long enough to raise a friendly hand to be sure. And I think I will finish with um, one more poem that invokes the landscapes of the Southwest and particularly the Bears Ears landscape. Uh, this poem is called Gravel Cheese Box Hideout. Um, just a great phrase I lifted. Uh, in fact, Gravel Cheese Box and Hideout are the names of three canyons down in southeast Utah. Um, so, gravel, cheese box, hideout. Two friends study the deep history of the Southwest. One makes inquiries from words, the other from local dug up clay, pots, bowls, and cups. He uses terms like off gassing, micaceous. Both find human beauties in prehistoric rock. What is the flute player doing on his back? Why the antler creature so far up a cliff? In the open kiln, a branch of juniper hiss, speaking it back into the ground. Speaking the evil at Chaco Canyon back, that is. The old ones have their demagogues, slaves or someone duped by myth, who built the giant Pueblo complex? Today I write poems. Prose is too hard in this heat. The vessel gets brittle, fractures. News says 130 degrees Death Valley today. Do not try to master the secret techniques of power over others. Oh, spirit, you've got further tasks with canyons, the green mask, the yucca fiber brush, with night, sleep, companions, the stars. Thank you for listening, everybody. Appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much. So fantastic. Love them, love them. Yeah, that was really fabulous. And I want to open it up to questions now. I would love people just to feel free to, to ask Andrew anything that he would like to say. Paul, yeah, I see your oh. hand up. Well, first of all, thanks. Fantastic. Um, and, uh, and I knew you would be doing your homework about this. And it's really beautiful to see where your, uh, where your nose uh, or your intellect or the combination of the both leads you regarding such a subject. Um, regarding Michael and the ghost tantras, this is a very interesting gathering to discuss something like that because I have this very strong intuitive hit that Michael um, got the inspiration for the ghost tantras doing Latihan. And there would be a way to find out, and that would be going to the Special Collections Library in Burnaby, British Columbia, and looking at his journals and see how closely they're related, his experience of being open in Subud and his, uh, his creation of the ghost tantras. He did write about uh, men doing Latihan in his essay, Reason, which was in the second edition of the Meat Science Essays. So the fact that this is a Subud gathering, that you bring up McClure and the ghost tantras, that there are Canadians here, and we focus on this, or, or, or that, that this comes up, to me is fascinating. And for the men, uh, Andrew and Rahman among them, who have done Latihan, those sounds are something that could be very easy, that I think are regularly heard, or something like them, are heard. And I've made a few of them myself in Latihan. So it's fascinating that you bring them up. Um, and, and then I just want to go to one thing that you said, this notion of power over others. I think that as, is at the core of what peace might be to me. Uh, not to have power over others, but to be in a position where you don't need to try to do that, where you don't need to uh, attempt to control things, but you have faith that the right things will happen, and you set your intention for those. I think those are all among, among the things that I uh, believe are 
uh, qualities of peace. So how you articulated them in that poem and how that's a style of yours to have in, in your poems quite often this one line that just is a knockout punch and that comes up so unexpectedly. So it's a combination of surprise mind, very clear perception and uh, delivered in such a way that it's uh, quite remarkable. So thank you for that. Thanks, thanks, Paul. Yeah, I was gonna to say too that the lines that came after that, oh spirit, you have other tasks. Um, and the ending of that poem came because I, I, I read a lovely interview with um, the poet Susan Howe and she pointed out how much she was reading what is in some ways Walt Whitman's death poem uh, called A Clear Midnight. And I went and memorized that poem and carried it around with me for a month or so. And, uh, you know, so a little bit of the other language in that poem comes, you know, in a way as channeled from Walt Whitman through Susan Howe. Um, so. Hi, I see Amy with a hand up. Sure, hi. Hi. So in answer to Paul's musings, it was Kundalini Yoga that Michael was practicing on a daily basis. And he got to the point where the ball of silence inside, and I'm sort of not quoting him exactly, but the ball of silence inside of him became so intense that he felt that language no longer mattered. So the, the antidote to the silence was to begin to write in the language he was hearing, which was pure sound. And that's how the ghost tantras came about. And he immediately knew at the writing of the first one that there would be 99 of them. So that's, that's sort of the source of them. And once he began to write them, then he traveled to Quotla de Jimenez to gather the magic mushroom because they'd run out of LSD for the experiments they were doing at UC Berkeley because the US military had bought it all up. So he and Sterling Bennell went to Quotla de Jimenez and collected magic mushrooms and met Maria Sabina and brought back the first leaves of the Good Shepherdess um, and sort of hanging out of Sterling's pockets as they got on the plane in Mexico City which I don't think you could do today, bringing back a psychedelic sage to the US in the pockets of your raincoat. But anyway, um, that's where the ghost tantras came from. And some of them were written on the trip and on the plane down to Mexico, but they started in, in basically on the, the rug in a spot of sunlight in its apartment in the Haight-Ashbury after a little too much Kundalini yoga, not knowing quite how to deal with that ball of silence. So in answer to Paul, that's sort of the, the, the source of them as far as my understanding. You're gonna to have to write his biography, Paul. <laughs> I'm, not worthy, I'm not worthy, but I appreciate that. Um, I appreciate that explanation and, and it does, I do believe I've read that somewhere I do remember uh, when I told them that I was going up to the Wack Bennett Special Collections Library, Simon Fraser, to look at his stuff. He said, "Do they make you wear the put on the gloves, the, the white gloves, before you look at the stuff?" And then I remember seeing his journals, and there were many admonitions by you written in them for him to not do work. So um, <laughs> it was interesting to see. Let's say it. Let's just say that. Wow, thank you. That was a really super interesting segue. I have a question for you, Andrew. Um, you, in one of your last poems, I think it might have been the last one, um, you asked the question, is there a chance that poems might slip a gap? And I wondered if you could speak to the role of poetry going forward in, in this uncertain future. Um, and yeah, and, and all that you bring to the poetry that you're doing as well. Oh, you know, I think I prefer almost to leave that as a question because I feel perhaps we just don't have any idea at all. I do, um, um, uh, I think, you know, maybe some of you knew the um, poet and translator, um, Michael Connor, 
um, who died a year ago, maybe, uh, or thereabouts. And um, some of his friends sent me some ashes to scatter and I went and scattered them. And then I wrote a poem from him and I won't read the poem, but um, I will read just three lines from it, which maybe says something to what you're asking. Um, thinking of him as both a poet and translator, you know, language person as I am. Um, and I said to him, the jobs to store seeds of language, of rhythm for the better world, there in front, around the bend, out ahead. So, you know, in terms of the question of whether a poem can slip the gap or gap a fence, um, you know, I don't think we know, but the, the faith is, the faith is that you're, you know, you can store up seeds no matter how bad things get, that they're there for future people, you know, for a little bit of courage, a little bit of love, a little bit of good humor, a little bit of comradeship, you know. Um, you know, I think in that poem, I had also said to him, I envy you the cool friendship poems found in China. You envied India's spicier lyrics. We used to have this sort of running relationship because he was translating those grand, cool poems by, you know, Jia Dao and, you know, Du Fu and others, Li Po, who wrote beautiful poems of friendship. And he'd always say, I love those poems you translate from India that are so, you know, erotic and juicy. And I'd say, I love those poems of friendship you do. They're like being up on the tundra. And uh, so we had this sort of, you know, running, um, you know, mental warfare between us. Thank you. That's a good answer. And, and I think you've captured it in that image of the seeds going forward and the seeds that carry so much from the past and the wisdom of the past. So thank you. Did anyone else have a question? Um, you I'd like to make a comment if I could uh, for Andrew Schelling. Andrew, what I um, think I see from the poems that you read today, um, I'm afraid I don't know any of the else in your work. Um, I'm new to this whole world, is how rooted in place your poems are. It, it very, I get this very, very vivid picture in my mind um, and senses of where you, you're, you, you locate each poem almost in a place. Um, and um, I love it, uh, but that's, uh, I'm not, uh, I don't know if that's all your poetry is like that or, or if that's deliberate or, is, or um, does it, do you feel that your own poetry balances your translation? It's, uh, you're, you're going somewhere else in your, in your imagination? Um, how, how do you? Well, that's a nice way of putting it. I hadn't thought of that, you know, balancing the translation. Um, yeah, for, for better or for worse, um, I think I made a decision when I moved to Colorado to really commit to this place and to learn the bioregion in particular. Um, you know, uh, I share with a number of people here on this screen an interest in, you know, redesigning the way we approach the world, thinking in terms of bioregions and a sense of loyalty to one's own region and uh, a sense of wanting to know it and wanting to know, you know, the residents and the residents aren't just human residents, they're human also, but there's, you know, all sorts. So I, I think I have, um, you know, deliberately set about learning what I can of this place. And, um, you know, most of my poems do get located here. It, it's semi-conscious, you know, sometimes I think it's a liability. Um, my translations, since they're all from India, really operate in a whole other sphere in an interesting way. And yet I consider the two um, tasks to be hand in hand or, you know, very much, you know, part of a single, single task. Um, and, uh, you know, an interesting thing that I've tried to do, I don't know how successfully, I didn't read any today, but I've been doing a few poems, which are really a translation by an early Indian poet named Vidya. She's considered maybe the greatest and the earliest of the Sanskrit women poets. Um, and I take a poem of hers and then I reply or respond or, jam with in a poem of my own. So I'm not necessarily you know, responding, but in some ways her poem is, you know, setting me off into um, 
you know, a poem of my own. And so it becomes in a funny way, a mix of bioregions too. I don't know how successful it is. I didn't read them any, to, to, any today, possibly because I'm a little uh, less secure about how well they work, but um, you know, I may keep trying it. But yeah, so I have, you know, and then, um, uh, you know, many of my play, my poems are place-based. And I think that's, uh, you know, <laughs> that's like the land itself, you know, seems to find a way to capture me all the time. And it's not really my doing, um, you know, uh, land captures the language too. So, you know, the, the one other thing I've done besides working all these years with Sanskrit is I, um, for a while, uh, you know, took on a lot of the localized languages that aren't English to see what I could learn from them. Spanish being one, Arapaho being another, Ute being another, um, uh, because I felt that these may be held the land better than the newcomer English did. And I found that to be the case in interesting ways. Um, and uh, so, you know, I, I think one of the projects is uh, to love the land. I mean, I could take this all the way back to one of my early teachers at uh, when I was in college, uh, a remarkable shamanic professor, poet, character named Norman O'Brown, who used to say, that if the ecology movement doesn't have a spiritual or religious base, it'll never get any traction. Um, and so I think by going into the land, really becoming intimate with it, and that, that became in a way my belief that if you want to, um, uh, you know, struggle for the preservation of species, struggle for the preservation of land, you better know what you're talking about. You know, it's not just an abstraction out there. It's really, a, you know, a tightly woven um, ecology that, uh, you know, in many ways dwarfs our human accomplishments. That opening poem where I was asking, what did humans think writing could do? You know, it's the uh, great early ecologist Odom who, you know, made the statement that a cubic inch of soil contains more information in the Library of Congress. There's a koan to sit with. <laughs> you know, what is that information that a cubic inch of soil contains? Thank so you. thanks for your question, Andrew, but you know. Well, thank you very much. Talk uh, about for a long time, sure. Very, very thoughtful reply, I appreciate it. I'd also like to say that what Andrew brought up, about Andrew Schelling brought up about being connected to place. I mean, essentially, we live in our places like invaders, and that is the essence of war. So to be deeply connected to place and to know your place is a very peaceful act. And I think that's one of the beautiful things that comes through your work, all aspects of your work, not just your poetry, but your work and, uh, and your presence. So thank you, Andrew. We'll be gathering again on November 18th, I believe. So we'll be doing third Thursday and Daphne Marlet first um, declined our invitation to read next month. And she said, I've been thinking it over and I feel that I really don't have any poems for peace. Poems for the environment of this ailing earth, yes, but not poems for peace in the human world. I think it's a good project. I hope you find another poet who does. But uh, Andrew Hall and I were able to convince her that no, that's exactly what we're talking about. So um, that I think shows you a little bit of her humility and her consciousness. And it's going to be wonderful a month from now. And I hope you all attend. And I thank you all for coming. And Adelia, I'll let you wrap it up. Yeah, just to say thank, thank you, everyone, as well. Thank you. And thank you so much, Andrew, because you covered so much in your last answer. That was a question I also wanted to ask. And I appreciate what you have to say also about language holding the land. Very powerful, powerful reading. So thank you, everyone. And please, um, these readings are open. Do share the ideas the uh, links with your friends. Everybody is welcome. And thank you for attending. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you so much.